Well, hello and thank you for joining me. Thomas Stonewall Jackson, probably the most revered Confederate commander during the war between the states after General Robert E. Lee, said, When we take our meals, there is the grace. When I take a draught of water, I always pause to lift up my heart to God in thanks and prayer for the water of life. When I break the seal of a letter just received, I stop to pray to God that he may prepare me for his contents and make it a messenger of good. When I go to my classroom and await the arrangements of the cadets in their places, that is my time to intercede with God for them. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 16 through 18, we're told by the Apostle Paul, to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So let's pray. Father God, we do rejoice in the gift of every day. We ask that your will be done through all of our doings each and every day. We thank you for the example of men like Jackson and Lee and ask for that same desire to be guided in everything through constant prayer and relationship with you. And we ask this through the power of your Holy Spirit and in Christ Jesus' holy name. Amen. All of Job's counselors have had their say. Now Elihu is about to wrap up. Elihu believes Job's friends to have been wrong with their advice because he believes he having perfect spirit-led understanding, knows everything about God as well as the solution to Job's situation. He is so certain and so excited to have everyone understand that his heart pounds as he finishes up by testifying to the majesty of God. Let's pray. Father God, as we consider your word today, we ask that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you will guide us. And may these words of my mouth and this meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's now hear Job chapter 37. I'll be uh, reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Uh, please follow along in your own. Job chapter 37. My heart pounds at this and leaps in my chest. Just listen to his thunderous voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. He lets it loose beneath the entire sky, his lightning to the ends of the earth. Then comes a roaring sound. God thunders with his majestic voice. He does not restrain the lightning when his rumbling voice is heard. God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. For he says to the snow, fall to the earth, and the torrential rains, his mighty torrential rains, serve as his sign to all mankind, so that all men may know his work. The wild animals enter their lairs and stay in their dens. The windstorm comes from its chamber, and the cold from the driving north winds. Ice is formed by the breath of God, and watery expanses are frozen. He saturates clouds with moisture. He scatters his lightning through them. They swirl about, turning round and round at his direction, accomplishing everything he commands them over the surface of the inhabited world. He causes this to happen for punishment for his land or for his faithful love. Listen to this, Job. Stop and consider God's wonders. Do you know how God directs his clouds or makes their lightning flash? Do you understand how the clouds float? those wonderful works of him who has perfect knowledge? You whose clothes get hot when the south wind brings calm to the land, can you help God to spread out the skies as hard as a cast metal mirror? Teach us what we should say to him. We cannot prepare our case because of our darkness. Should he be told that I want to speak? Can a man speak when he is confused? Now men cannot even look at the sun when it is in the skies, after a wind has swept through and cleared them away. 
Yet out of the north he comes, shrouded in a golden glow. Awesome majesty surrounds him. The Almighty, we cannot reach him. He is exalted in power. He will not oppress justice and abundant righteousness. Therefore men fear him. He does not look favorably on any who are wise in heart. This is the word of God. Thanks and praise be to God. Chapter 37 began. My heart pounds at this and leaps from my chest. Can you remember a time when you were so excited to share what you knew? How the anticipation was so overwhelming, your heart just pounded in your chest. Well, that's where Elihu is as he continues his discourse. And he should be. He's about to tell everyone listening about how God speaks. Just listen to his thunderous voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. He lets it loose beneath the entire sky, his lightning to the ends of the earth. Then there comes a roaring sound. God thunders with his majestic voice. Here, there's a small challenge as to how God speaks when we consider 1 Kings 19, verses 11 and 12. At that moment, the Lord passed by. A great and mighty wind was tearing at the mountains and was shattering cliffs before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a voice, a soft whisper. So God can speak in a mighty wind or, in, or an earthquake or through fire. Remember Moses and the burning bush? But he also speaks in a soft whisper. My wife and I love to sit, listen, and watch God's amazing displays of thunder and lightning. But I'm not certain we see them as God speaking to us. We do see them as a display of his majesty. How about you? Elihu continues. He does not restrain the lightning when his rumbling voice is heard. God thunders marvelously with his voice. Now the Life Application Study Bible has this to say. Nothing can compare to God. His power and presence are awesome. And when he speaks, we must listen. Too often we presume to speak for God, as did Job's friends to put words in his mouth, to take him for granted, or to interpret his silence to mean that he is absent or unconcerned. But God cares. He is in control, and he will speak. Be ready to hear his message. In the Bible, in your life through the Holy Spirit, and through circumstances and relationships. Elihu goes on with the attributes of God. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. Well, here, Elihu gets it right. As he almost literally quotes Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Well, Elihu now focuses on God's sovereignty. For he says to the snow, fall to the earth. And the torrential rains, his mighty torrential rains, serve as his sign to all mankind, so that all men may know his work. Wild animals enter their lairs and stay in their dens. The Quest Study Bible has this to add. It seems that in every age, people become so focused on their own plans that they lose sight of God. Elihu knew that God's storms can easily halt men's plans, forcing them to remain inside for shelter. Busy schedules and hectic activities allow people little time to give to God or to see what he is doing when bad weather forces the cancellation of our plans. Perhaps God wants us to slow down a bit so that we would notice him. 
Let me share with you. As I prepare this message, it is one of those rainy days when I'm unable to work outside. And I ask myself, was this God's way of focusing me? I hope so. Elihu continues about the majesty of God. The windstorm comes from its chamber and the cold from the driving north winds. Ice is formed by the breath of God and watery expanses are frozen. He saturates clouds with moisture. He scatters his lightning through them. They swirl about, turning round and round at his direction, accomplishing everything he commands them over the surface of the inhabited world. Again, our young expositor seems to have it right. But does he? Remember our overarching question as we began our study? Did God ordain all that has happened to Job? Elihu seems to believe God did. As he says, he, God, causes this to happen for punishment for his land or for his faithful love. If we will recall, there was a challenge by Satan over Job's incentive to be righteous. This was followed by Satan's use of nature to bring a whirlwind of epic proportion causing the death of all Job's children. Was allowing all this God's way of demonstrating his faithful love? Let's consider. God has told us we will not understand his ways. And in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 45, Jesus tells us, For God makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. As God is the creator and sustainer of everything, being sovereign, he can use anything and everything in all creation to both love and discipline us. Well, Elihu continues, almost as if he has foresight over what is coming. Listen to this, Job. Stop and consider God's wonders. Do you know how God directs his clouds or makes their lightning flash? Do you understand how the clouds float, those wonderful works of him who has perfect knowledge? Elihu is sharing all this with his own claim to be one who has perfect knowledge. There may be a little pride in this, as we've noted before. Perhaps as followers of Christ Jesus, we should see this as a warning. We need to be extremely careful when we share the truth contained in God's word. We need to be certain what we share is inspired by the Holy Spirit and not our own interpretation. Now, the Evidence Bible has this to say. We are often busy, too busy, to consider the amazing creation in which we live. When we ponder the clouds, the stars, the birds, the trees, the flowers, the animals, the vast array of foods, the marvels of the human body, all in light of God's creative hand. When we consider them, audible praise is not enough to express the incredible greatness of our God. As Elihu continues with his understanding of God, he challenges Job. You whose clothes get hot when the south wind brings calm to the land, can you help God spread out the skies as hard as a cast metal mirror? Teach us what we should say to him. We cannot prepare our case because of our darkness. Should he, God, be told that I want to speak? Can a man speak when he is confused? So there it is, Job. You are a mere human and confused. Should you confront God and tell him how to act? That's Elihu's question. And driving his point home, Elihu explains, Now men cannot even look at the sun when it is in the skies. And after a wind has swept through and cleared them away. The point being made here is multifaceted. In Exodus 33 verse 20, Moses has God speaking to him and saying, You cannot see my face for no man shall see me and live. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus says, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. 
Now, Elihu didn't see God as a self-sacrificing God, as Jesus on the cross. He did understand God's majesty and sovereignty, however, as he proclaims, yet out of the north he comes, shrouded in golden glow, awesome majesty surrounds him. Now, the quest Bible study asks this question. Why compare God to the sun? God's glory is often described in the Bible as brilliant and unapproachable, just like the powerful rays of the sun. God is sometimes described as a consuming fire. In a natural, physical sense, the sun serves as a good metaphor for God because of its power and glory. With his understanding of God, Elihu makes some contradictory statements. The Almighty, we cannot reach him, he is exalted in power. Well, Elihu is absolutely correct. God is exalted in power, but he is dead wrong as he claims we cannot reach him. Elihu also claims he will not oppress justice and abundant righteousness. Again, true. God is just and cannot go against his very nature. He is holy. Therefore men fear him. He does not look favorably on any who are wise in heart. Elihu concludes with his understanding of God's nature as he shares one last truth. Men should fear God if they see themselves as just in their own nature. Because God will not see that as righteous behavior, and this will require punishment. Unfortunately, even as Elihu does not understand God's true nature, he does end with an eternal truth. There will be a final judgment where everyone will stand before the great judge. Everyone. That's right. Everyone will stand there guilty and deserving of punishment. But those who have believed in Christ Jesus, will stand with the penalty already paid and be seen as the righteousness of God's very own Son. Brothers, sisters, friends, Elihu has had a whole lot to say. He certainly has a healthy regard for God's sovereignty and believes God to be just in his treatment of sinful man. The one truth he cannot understand is God's loving, forgiving nature. But we can. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Ephesians 2 verse 8. I cannot say it often enough or strongly enough. There is an urgency to all this. If you have not asked Jesus for forgiveness of your sins and accepted his death on the cross as payment for those very sins, ask him now. Because the sad truth is, we are not guaranteed tomorrow. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for sending your son. We thank you for sending your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the wisdom we receive through the Spirit's empowering. We ask to be empowered to live lives reflecting your Son, that we may be your light in our families, our communities, our nation, in our world. And we ask this in the name above all others, Jesus the Christ. Amen and amen. Well, thank you again for joining me today. As always, I value your comments, so please share them with me. And if you need prayer or just someone to listen, message me and, and I will get back to you. Next week, we will hear from the ultimate source as God replies to everyone. We will also celebrate the Lord's Supper. So please join me. And may your week be filled to overflowing 
with the love of Christ. And may you take that love and dance before him, as King David did. Until we meet again, whether it be here or in heaven above. God bless you.